Welcome back to Cunningham's Law Review, where our goal is to listen to the top artisan songs of the last 100 years, starting in 1920 and working our way forward. Every Monday, we review what we hear and share the history of popular music with you as we do. I'm Richie, and you're listening to Side A of our third episode featuring the music of 1923. In today's episode, we'll be listening to the debut of W.C. Handy, Art Landry, Benny Kruger, Fiddlin' John Carson, and the Georgians. And we'll also be checking in on Cunningham's veteran, Ted Lewis, who is one of the few artists featured in each year of the reviews so far. Let's start by taking a look at the new artist that we'll be hearing from today, starting with W.C. Handy. Now, William Christopher Handy was born in 1873 in Florence, Alabama, and he would grow up to be one of the most influential composers of the 20s. Much like Jelly Roll Morton was crucial to the spread of jazz because he recorded and published his compositions successfully, W.C. Handy did the same thing for blues, and specifically for the Delta blues, though what we'll hear today is certainly not what we would consider Delta blues today. For this, he deservedly is referred to as the father of the blues. As an aside, if you're interested in seeing where W.C. Handy grew up, the cabin that his grandfather built has been preserved as an historic site in Florence, Alabama and can be visited. But that home was not a conducive place for a young musician, as Handy's father, a pastor, forbid musical instruments in his house. In secret, and much like the story from Where the Red Fern Grows, Handy picked berries and made soap that he sold to save up for a guitar little by little. When he had finally saved up enough money for the guitar, he bought it. And when he did, it doesn't seem like he had an exit strategy because he brought it back home and his father immediately forbade it and made him take it back. But since you can at least play the organ in church, Handy's father allowed him to learn the organ. Handy quickly left the organ for the cornet joined a band in secret, and said himself that he tried his best to incorporate the sounds of birds and other animals from his home into the music that he would go on to create. In 1896, after years of trying to make a go of it as a musician to limited success, Handy married Elizabeth Price, with whom he had six children. Now eventually, Handy would find a success in trying to codify exactly what it is that made the music of black musicians sound so distinct, especially from the more strictly scaled music of Europeans. He worked as a professor in music, and as he would travel around the country listening to the music of other black Americans, he wanted to figure out exactly what it was that made it work. And about this he said, quote, The primitive southern negro, as he sang, was sure to bear down on the third and seventh tone of the scale, slurring between major and minor. Whether in the cotton field of the Delta or on the levee up St. Louis way, it was always the same. Till then, however, I had never heard this slur used by a more sophisticated Negro or by any white man. I tried to convey this effect by introducing flat thirds and sevenths, now called blue notes, into my song, although its prevailing key was major, and I carried this device into my melody as well. This was a distinct departure, but as it turned out, it touched a spot. As we listen to Handy's St. Louis Blues performed by his own band, a song which we have heard many other artists perform since it was so popular, but that Handy wrote, Pay attention to the introduction, as it is a tango style before abruptly changing into the dancier blues section. That was intentional, because the tango was popular at the time when this song was written, and it was done just to take advantage of that. Handy would go on to have a long and successful career in music recording until the end of the 30s. He would unfortunately pass away from pneumonia in 1958 at the age of 84, and about 175,000 people paid their respects to him in person, by gathering around the church where his funeral was held. Truly, he was the father of the blues and the musical enjoyment of many others. Our next artist, Art Landry, is surprisingly hard to find information about. Basically, Art Landry is a very talented white man who was smart enough to learn from the best black artists of the time, and talented enough to lead a band that played the same music. Born in 1896 in Montreal and living until 1990 at the age of 94 when he passed, Art Landry is the first person that we have reviewed on the show who was able to see Return of the Jedi. And he also may have seen Back to the Future Part 3, even an early cell phone. He would have grown up in a world of music without the electric microphone and died in one with color televisions and Eddie Van Halen. It is insane to think about the changes that the 20th century saw. Now, one of Art Landry's biggest hits was today's dreamy melody. But as I listen to it, I'm not able to confirm that this is the original recording because it sounds exceptionally clear, and that's not likely to have been possible in the early 20s when the song was supposed to have been recorded. 
However, there are some hallmarks of pre-electronic recording, such as the use of banjo instead of a guitar, and the lack of drums. So if you can confirm that this is the original pre-electronic recording, please let us know at Cunning Review on Twitter. Based on the instrumental arrangement, it's totally possible that this is the original recording, but it's been since remastered to enhance clarity and sound. Our next artist, Benny Kruger, was born in 1899, and he was a saxophonist that is interestingly one of the first recorded on record, and he did so with the original Dixieland Jazz Band in 1920. We didn't listen to those records because the band hadn't reached the level of popularity that their later works would help them achieve, but as Kruger was one of the saxophonists that Victor liked to use at the time, they put him on the ODJB record because they thought it needed saxophone. Right or wrong there, Kruger would have a successful career in music, and then as an orchestral director for Rudy Valley and Bob Crosby. That's right, Bob Crosby, not Bing. Bing was Bob Crosby's older brother. Now the Georgians are an interesting band, because they were a part of the Paul Specht Orchestra, which unfortunately doesn't have their songs available on Spotify and would otherwise be featured in this episode. Now, the Georgians were a subset of the Paul Specht Orchestra who would play smaller gatherings, like a cocktail room. The band was led by trumpeter Frank Gorenti, who grew up playing in New Orleans along with ODJB member Nick LaRocca, Tony Parenti, who would play with Ted Lewis, and King Oliver, who had his own band that we spoke highly of in the previous episode. The Georgians played Dixieland Jazz, and the intro of their first song sounds strangely much more modern than you would expect, so keep an ear out for that. It honestly sounds like a Squirrel Nut Zipper song called The Ghost of Stephen Foster. Our final new artist for the day is Fiddlin' John Carson, who was born in 1868, which may make him the oldest person we've discussed on the show so far. He was born in Cobb County, Georgia, so he's ironically also a Georgian. Carson learned how to play the violin growing up, but wouldn't consider a career in music. Instead, he would work in a cotton mill for the next 20 years and have a normal life until 1914 when the mill went on strike. He then started playing on the street, writing down and printing his own songs to sell the music for, and got thrown in jail for slander when he accused the governor of taking a bribe in a murder case in one of his songs. His success in fiddling competitions, as seven out of the eight next years he would be crowned champion fiddler of Georgia, led him to his radio debut in 1922 where his career took off. An influential distributor for OK Records, Polk C. Brockman, told OK to record Carson after seeing him in a newsreel. And thinking about that, it would have been a silent newsreel, because the first talkie wasn't until 1927. So Carson got a record deal based off of a silent movie. Times were different. Unbelievably, John Carson would go gold with You Will Never Miss Your Mother Until She's Gone. More believable, he was a well-known anti-Semite and played often at KKK rallies. Combined with Eck Robertson Foundational Legacy, we have here two for two fiddlers who were involved in the oppression of minorities at the same time as they were instrumental in the building of country music. Now, to be honest, I like country music, and so I'm a little ashamed and disappointed in the originator's identity so far. Eck Robertson was associated with the Confederacy, as was his partner Fiddler, and now we have John Carson who's associated with the KKK and a known anti-Semite. And that's a bummer for people like myself who enjoy a lot of country music, but there it is. Now, almost everyone in today's episode is new to Cunningham's Law Review, which has been happening a lot to our 1923 episodes. It's as if this year there was a sea change sweeping in a ton of diversity, not only just in terms of what we've seen with race and culture, but even in the simple sense of there being more artists available to hear from in the top songs. The one artist that we've already covered is Ted Lewis, and he was born in Circleville, Ohio in 1890 and was one of the earliest jazz performers to gain popularity, but so far his performances have left a lot to be desired. Lewis's trilling clarinet would start him off on a path toward mastering the styles of many others and quickly incorporating them into his own repertoire. His band would quickly assimilate musical styles and make them into their own. I find that to be one of the more interesting things about the Ted Lewis music because by itself it's average, but the fact that Lewis didn't do much original, it's impressive that he was so deft at hearing what would work and incorporating it quickly into his own recordings. In 1920, he earned an average of 13.3 points out of 25. In 1921, he didn't improve much to an average of 14. And the last time we heard from him was our 1922 episodes where he earned a 14.5 with two passable songs in Everybody Step and Marie. Hopefully, he can keep this upward swing going, but they would just get him to average at this point. But let's stop talking about the music and let's start listening. For those of you listening to the podcast through Spotify, there's a version of the episode available to you, which features all of the music as a part of the podcast, so you'll only have to press play once and everything including the music will play on its own. 
The episodes with built-in music are limited to Spotify, so if you're listening to this episode through a different service or on YouTube and still want to listen along to the music, a playlist of what we're listening to today is on Spotify and is called Cunningham's Law Review 1923-3. You won't need a paid account to access that playlist. You can also find a link to this episode on the Cunningham's Law Review subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. We want to know what you think about our reviews and the music we're hearing, so make sure to join us on the subreddit, leave us an anchor voicemail, or reach out on Twitter at Cunning Review. That's all for side A of episode 1923-3. We'll see you for the reviews after the songs on side B. Welcome back to Cunningham's Law Review, episode 1923-3, where we're listening to hits from a huge amount of Cunningham's debut artists today. We heard from Art Landry, Benny Kruger, Ted Lewis, a killer from the Georgians, W.C. Handy himself playing the St. Louis Blues, and one of the first country hits from Fiddlin' John Carson. This is the B-side of the podcast, where we review each of the songs in today's music and talk more about the impact that these songs had. If you'd like to join the conversation, the Cunningham's Law subreddit will have a dedicated post for this episode at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. And we'd love to hear from you through an anchor voicemail or on Twitter at Cunning Review. I'm Richie, your host, and I hope you enjoyed the music or at least heard something new. Let's get right into it as we take the MICA system to Art Landry's ethereal offering, Dreamy Melody. As a reminder, the MICA system features five categories of one to five points each, mastery, innovation, catchiness, authenticity, and artistic statement. The lowest score is a five because some music is better than none, and the top score is a 25. Right away, Dreamy Melody gets pretty close to living up to its name, and you can picture lovers at the end of the night on the dance floor in satin gowns and tuxedos waltzing along to the banjo strumming with their heads on each other's shoulders and just hoping the night won't end. It's the kind of song you remember for a long time after you hear it, more for the moments it supported rather than the song itself. But that's not to say that the song is not impressive on its own, but rather that it is so cohesive with the moments that it's meant for that it conjures them intrinsically as a part of those moments rather than separate from them. In terms of mastery, the song receives a four for working so well within itself that the instruments approach the same tonality with one another and lend to that cohesiveness. Innovation-wise, this is a waltz in more or less standard arrangement for the time with violin, banjo, horn, and clarinet, and receives a three, though it is very well put together here. Catchiness is a four as I find myself putting it on a few more times than I have to as I write this, and I continue to enjoy new things in it as I re-listen. Artistic statement is a four due to the inherent tonal approach in both the arrangement and execution of the song, where each piece flows well within itself and into the next, But as with most lyric-free songs, authenticity is difficult to justify higher scores for, since Landry himself didn't write the song and really only did a great job playing it on the record, and so receives a 3 for a total score of 18 out of 25 points. Our next song, That Old Gang of Mine, is one you might recognize since it was covered by so many artists over the coming decades, including Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, and Perry Como. But if not, don't fret. It's just a song about missing your friends that you used to pal around with. More than anything, it reminds me of the kind of song that would be good if you wanted to impress a bunch of old guys at a bar around Yale, because they'd probably know it. For the MICA score though, that doesn't leave a lot to say since mastery is hindered by the relatively unchallenged instrumentation until the very last portion of the song, which features a tacked on Dixieland jazz portion. Now that unchallenged instrumentation makes sense because the song was meant for the vaudeville stage and was premiered by duo Van and Shank, who we last talked about in episode 1921-1, where we spoke about one of their songs that you'll definitely know, Ain't We Got Fun. However, that vaudeville focus almost always focused on the lyrical and acted portrayal of the song rather than complex musicianship, and so for mastery, Benny Kruger's band earns a three. Similarly, in innovation, they stay away from two territory with their half-hearted adoption of the Dixieland portion, earning a three. Catchiness is a three as well, since while the song doesn't need to hurry up and end, I'm not going to be putting on repeat either, and it's half forgotten as it is already. The song earns a 2 for artistic statement and authenticity, since what little statement there is is in saying you miss your old friends, which is repetitive and not fleshed out, but can also pretty much apply to anyone when it's this vague, making it hard to be authentic. That brings Benny Kruger's That Old Gang of Mine to a total of 13. 
Now we take a look at the Tin Roof Blues with Cunningham's alum, Ted Lewis. The piano here starts out a bit robotic, and based on that I was not looking forward to the rest of the song within the first five seconds, and especially because Ted Lewis's performance has been underwhelming at best, whelmed if you're in Europe. But it did marginally get better. Here we have the results of Ted Lewis doing what he does best, which is adopting the styles of other musicians into his own band, but yet again he fails to adopt it in a convincing way. The music seems as if they heard someone swinging at a blues club, said, hey, we can do that, and then laid down this track while they were still figuring out what it exactly meant to do that. Lewis's version is overshadowed by better versions by Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong, who would later play this with a much more convincing swing. For mastery, the song receives a two. Innovation and catchiness the same as the stilted swing takes you out of the song rather than bringing you deeper in. Authenticity is a rare one, and since any artistic statement attempted to be made was unsuccessful, that is a one as well for a total score of eight, one of the lowest scores of the podcast so far. The song is simply not good at what it attempts to do, and it does so unconvincingly and inauthentically. Ted Lewis's next song, Bee's Knees, is a bad recording for sure, but that could be an artifact of storage and remastery or quite a few other things, since we're listening to it through a digital format and we know it wasn't recorded in a digital format to start with, so we can give some leeway as to whether or not this is how it was originally recorded and why it's so noisy. Giving it the benefit of the doubt and assuming that the recording was made professionally at the time, as Ted Lewis's other recordings were... If we can move past that, the song is lively, and it's unfortunate that one of Lewis's better songs seems to have been poorly shepherded through time. While it's a jazzed up version of a more vaudeville sound and can sound a bit theatrical, the song is complex and interesting enough that it adds to the medium. It almost sounds as if it would be at home as the soundtrack for a silent movie rather than as a standalone performance or dance hall song. Across the board, the song receives a 3 for a total score of 15. In Cut Yourself a Piece of Cake, we have a song that originally had lyrics, and the lyrics were about a wife who can't cook steak or can't cook donuts or can't cook anything else, and remind yourself this is the 20s, so that was her primary occupation, but she can make cake. So she encourages her husband to have cake for dinner when he comes home. She encourages the landlord to have a piece of cake when he comes to visit. She encourages everyone to have a piece of cake because that's all she can make. Outdated gender roles aside, the song is a Billy Murray song first, and so it isn't meant to be taken seriously with comic phrasing and situations. Of course, this version doesn't have the lyrics, so it relies on the music to carry the song. Ironic, since the song doesn't feature much in the way of crazy or interesting music. Lewis's clarinet stands in for the vocals of Murray in this version, but it's another bland Lewis version of a jazzed-up popular song for a mica score of 32332, totaling 13. Of special note, Lewis's band has adopted the use of the mute horn pretty much instantaneously after King Oliver's band did. We noted in our review of Ted Lewis's Royal Garden Blues that they actually referenced mute horn prior to it ever being recorded by King Oliver, so it was at least known about. But in standard Lewis fashion, they've done a terrible job of putting it in the song. It sounds awful. It sounds as if the horn player used his own fist as a mute and that this was the result. And if that was the only interesting thing about this otherwise bland song, that would be enough. But something else crazy happens at the end, and I can't believe I've never heard anyone talk about this before. Starting at 3.02 and going for about 10 seconds, there's a recognizable bit on the song. And if you recognize it, give yourself a pat on the back, because it is featured prominently in a song that you don't know the name of called The Merry-Go-Round Broke Down. You don't know the name because it's almost always known as the Looney Tunes theme song. Now, I can't find anywhere that documents the connection between the merry-go-round broke down and Ted Lewis's band playing Cut Yourself a Piece of Cake, but it's identical. And since the Looney Tunes theme song wouldn't be published for another 14 years in 1937, it certainly seems that this portion of the song was lifted and repurposed almost note for note in the Looney Tunes song. Insane. Moving on from Ted Lewis to someone much more talented, we have W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues. And it's very obvious in the intro of this song that W.C. Handy was trying to play a bit of tango to get people onto the dance floor, and then quickly changing over to a different style once he had them. You have to at least admire the shrewdness. Now the St. Louis Blues is pivotally important in its role to bring about the popularity of the blues, and Handy is representing the music well with his band here. It's especially worth noting that the band is able to quiet themselves, since they would have had to have done this physically, as there was no way to do a fade electronically yet. 
The band approaches the same melodies and phrases from different angles throughout the song, featuring the full arrangement in interesting ways as they keep the song from being repetitive without lyrics. Mastery thereby is a four, an innovation of four for fusing the tango and blues rhythms, but also in recognition of Handy's contribution to the song as its writer. Catchiness is a three, authenticity is a four, an artistic statement of four as well for the different approaches to the music that the arrangement shifts the balance for, for a total of 19. Now to the Georgians with I Wish I Could Shimmy Like My Sister Kate, and what a weird title that is. Now this song is a revelation into dark jazz when everything so far has been very upbeat. Instead, this song pulls no punches with its intro and sounds like the intro to a horror movie, or at least a horror cartoon from the 30s and 40s. It continues along its downtrodden way, taking on more of a New Orleans Dixieland jazz style until it sounds more and more like a standard jazz tune, but it never fully shakes the haunt of the opening, which is completely different than other versions of the song and instead it returns in the middle to really change the tone again into something more ominous and foreboding. Now, if this version featured the original lyrics of the song, I would argue that these continued shifts between light and dark moods would oddly juxtapose against themselves and be strange changes. But since this version eschews the lyrics altogether, they mitigate against that problem and are able to explore the melody itself in new ways. For mastery, the Georgians are in a four, Innovation is a 5 as I have only heard this in classical pieces up to now, style-wise, and it's extremely unique. Catchiness is a 3, authenticity is a 4 since they sound uniquely like themselves and are doing their own thing, and artistic statement is as well a 4 for bringing in new jazz expressions successfully. Micah's score for the Georgians Cunningham's Law debut is a smoking 20. As we said in the intro, the Georgians were part of the Paul Specht Orchestra. And while that band would play the big halls at the hotel they worked for, a smaller band would play the cocktail lounge, and that was the Georgians. It seems like the band was a bit more experimental than the orchestra, since during the same time the orchestra was playing bigger hits in a more standard arrangement, such as Falling and Some of These Days, which we talked about before. This song came out of nowhere, and I'm looking forward to more from the Georgians. Now in a complete departure from the Georgians who were on the cutting edge of complexity and fashion and music, let's instead go to a single singer with only his fiddle, Fiddlin' John Carson. While Carson's first song, Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane, was specifically inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1998, our introduction did cover that he was full-on tied to the KKK. So let's keep that in mind to give us an idea of who the person is that we're listening to. And Carson was also known to have used anti-Semitism to gin up political animosity in his early years, so that bears a mention too. But as always, we'll judge the music on its own merits, having made the acknowledgement that this is by no means someone to look up to personally. Having said that, Carson is a very soulful fiddle player. And though his mastery pales in comparison to Eck Robertson, who we reviewed in our first episode of 1922, His singing is better, and within it we can easily see the roots of country music being nurtured in a parallel track separate for now from the impacts of blues and jazz. It's interesting to even see how the vaudeville scene with glitz and glamour highlighted in songs like I Got Her That by Al Jolson live in comparison to the blues songs of Bessie Smith and the downtrodden sorrowful lyrics here in what has been called the first country hit. And it was a hit because of the rendition here, which is special as the song was written in 1871 and originally performed by minstrel shows, containing much more inflammatory language than this recording. Though the character singing is a black man who was likely meant to be a former slave when the song was written only six years after the Civil War, and you can catch that in the references to the master and missus, the way that the song is voiced here and the lyrical changes that Carson has made in his version help the song to be much more long-lived and reflect positively on his resistance to the easy racism that we've seen from so many other contemporary stars of that time, like Marion Harris. When you literally have no pressure to make changes from the low road, it's interesting to see that Carson removed racial slurs like Darkie from the original lyrics. The mica score on this one is 43343 for a total of 17. In another big hit for Carson, and one that shares some musical similarities in the intro with some of Eck Robertson's playing style, You Will Never Miss Your Mother Until She's Gone certainly seems less polished than that little old log cabin in the lane, but still it reflects a development in country music that is worth mentioning. The song also makes evident the connection between country music and rural gospel, as they feature a lot of the same structures. The song receives a total score of 16, with threes across the board save Innovation, which features a four. 
Well, that's all for this week's episode, but we'll be back next Monday with our fourth episode of 1923, featuring a few new artists and a big focus on one of the 20s and 30s best-selling artists who we haven't yet been able to focus on, Isham Jones, and I am excited for that one. Whether or not you agree with us, we want to know what you think, because Cunningham's Law states that the best way to learn something on the internet isn't to ask a question, but to post the wrong answer somewhere. So make sure to find the Cunningham's Law subreddit where we have a dedicated post for this episode at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. We'd love to hear from you through an Anchor voicemail or on Twitter at Cunning Review. If you leave us an Anchor voicemail that we end up using on the show, we'll review an album of your choice in a special episode, even if it's your own band's. If you like what we're doing here, leave us a review on your favorite podcasting service and follow the podcast everywhere you can. And if you don't like it, definitely don't mention that to anybody. Until next time, I've been your host, Richie, and you've been listening to Cunningham's Law Review. Our theme music is a difficult subject by The Insider, and nobody else works here. 